looking at uh, verses 15 through 21 here in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Allow me to read to you at verse 15. I'll read to verse 21. We'll get into our study. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Paul writes, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so we're going to be looking at these verses today, and so let me do a brief review for a few, just a few moments, actually, because we've got a lot to look at today in this passage. We know that Paul, up to this point, has been exhorting his readers to live a life that is called godly. He had begun in chapter 4, verse 1, by exhorting believers to have a, a walk, he says, that is worthy of the calling. So in the following verses, he, he began to describe to us what kind of walk that would be like. The Christian life would be characterized by various attributes, if you will. He had said in chapter 5, verse 2, that believers would walk in love, which would be selfless and sacrificing. In chapter 5, verse 8, he said that they would walk as children of light. In verse 11 of chapter 5, he said they would have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And all of these things are tied in together because Christians are intended to bring glory to God. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter had said it this way. He had said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so we walk in the light because we've been called out of darkness. We walk in the light because Jesus is the true light. We walk in the light because those who follow God do not walk in darkness, but walk in the, in the light of life. And so he's speaking to us concerning that. In verses 13 and 14, I pointed out that those verses contained an invitation. He had said, awaken you who sleep and arise from the dead. Awake, sinner, from your slumber of sin is what he's saying. You are unaware of your lost condition. And then he said, arise. He said, arise. That means repent. Turn away from your dead ways of sin, and God will give you through Christ, spiritual light. And so he's speaking concerning the walk of the believer. And here he continues encouraging us as believers to live a Christ-centered life. So he begins in verse 15, and he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So... I don't know how often you use the word circumspectly. I probably would guess right by saying we didn't use it today. This is probably the first time we've used the word circumspectly. And so I'll share with you what that means. Notice he says walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The word circumspectly is really a picture of being on your hands and your knees looking out for danger. It, it, it means to be watchful and cautious. It means to be on the alert, aware of any danger that might be there. It speaks of discernment, of discerning enemies. So walking circumspectly, as he says, speaks of walking consistently, correctly, and cautiously. The world is filled with spiritual landmines. The world is filled with traps. Walk being aware of these things. Be aware. You have a fiendish enemy seeking to destroy you. Like 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober-minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So we're to be careful. We're to be careful in how we live. We're to walk straight in the center of God's word. Like it says in Deuteronomy 5, 32, it says, therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you, you shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Stay in the direct center of his commands. Why? Because off to your right and off to your left, there's danger. When I was 16 or 17 years old, I was visiting a friend of mine, and he lived in Whittier, and 
Behind him was a small, kind of like an aqueduct. It was a little channel. It was a concrete channel, probably about um, 14 feet, 15 feet deep or so. And uh, there was a pipe that uh, went from one side to the other that uh, actually crossed over the cha uh, the, that channel. And uh, as I said, it was about 15 feet from the top of the pipe. It would have been more like 20 feet. And I decided I was going to walk across this pipe over this dry channel made of concrete. And I did okay for the first half. But then I started looking around and I started seeing how high that really was, especially as I was looking down from my vantage point. And before you know it, I was, I was petrified. I was so fr afraid because if I fell, I knew I would, well, I'd break up my body up, maybe even die. And so I sat down on this pipe in the middle of the pipe. And my friend's mom came out and saw me there and asked me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm praying for the first time in many years. And she had to talk me into uh, scooting across the rest of the, the, the distance. It was probably about 40 to 50 feet from one point to the other, and I was about halfway through. And I knew that in order for me to make it through, I was going to have to stay in the center of that pipe. Well, I've never forgotten that. So when I was reading and preparing the study, I began to think concerning what he's saying here. Walk circumspectly. Be aware of what's taking place around you. Be aware that there are spiritual landmines waiting to take you out. Be aware that you have an enemy, the enemy of the devil, who is roaring like a lion and seeking whom he may devour. So in order to remain safe from him, be on the alert and stay in the center of the will of God. And what he's saying to us is, is if you're walking circumspectly, you're going to be able to avoid the pitfalls that you can actually be destroyed by. We're to guard our walk. And if you guard your walk, it puts you in a place where God brings blessings into your life. Jeremiah 17, verse 8 says it like this. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So we'll be in the place where God can bless us. So walking circumspectly safeguards the gospel and actually will earn the gospel a more respectful hearing because the way that we live reveals how God is working in us. And when people see the way you live, it gives you an opportunity to share about what the Lord has done. So Titus 2, 7 and 8 says, In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. And so as you walk in a circumspect way, you're actually putting yourself in, the bless in a place of blessing. Um, Pastor Chuck used to say, I want to be under the spout where the blessing comes out. You'll be in the place of blessing, but also you're giving the gospel, uh, people an opportunity to hear this glorious gospel that changes lives and gives you opportunities to share. It also encourages other believers to live for Jesus Christ because the way that we live is an example how, of how Christians live. In Philippians 3.17, Paul said it like this. He said, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So if you're looking for somebody to be an example, a model of Christian faith, it's wise to choose one who's been walking with the Lord for some time because he can give you or she can give you a lot of, a, a lot of uh, illustrations, a lot of insight into how to walk for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're to walk circumspectly, aware of what is around us and the dangers. He says again in verse 15, we're to walk circumspectly, but not as fools, but as wise. Now, the word fool speaks of the one without wisdom. When somebody is acting foolishly, they're acting unintelligently. They're acting irresponsibly. They're acting as if God doesn't exist. That's why the psalmist said, the fool saith in his heart, there is no God. 
He lives as if there is no God. And so without faith in the Lord, the, the fool establishes himself as his own God. He establishes his own moral rules in accordance with his own fallen nature. Proverbs 12, 15 says it like this. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. So the product is a life that's earmarked by sin because God's ways are taken lightly. They reject God. They reject his word. They may attack the idea of believing in moral absolutes. Like it says in Proverbs 14, nine fools mock at sin. Well, the end result is they stand before God in judgment. The God that they said does not exist is the God they give an account of themselves to. So don't live as a fool. In 1 Peter 4, 3, and 5, 3 through 5, it says, You have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. They're surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, they heap abuse on you, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So he says, instead of walking as a fool, verse 15, you're to be wise. Notice, redeeming the time because the days, verse 16, the days are evil. The word redeeming speaks of buying something. It was used at that time, speaking of buying something out of a marketplace, the word redeeming could also be used of buying a slave in order to set him free. So you're buying something, but the time is a measured, allocated, or fixed season. It's a fixed period of time. So the point is we use every moment that we have, that we have been set free to serve God, we, we use every one of those moments because we're purchased and redeemed by Jesus. We have an allotted time to serve. So we're to use that time in order that we might be able to recognize that it's a gift and glorify God. Why do we do that? Well, notice he says the time is to be redeemed because he says the days are evil. When he says the days are evil, he's not simply speaking of the quality of evil, but the fact that it is in evil opposition to you. There's a pressure against you to live for God. It is in this, this time that we're living in is in active opposition to Jesus his message, as well as those who love him. I read something, uh, uh, an entertainment publicist by the name of Michael Levine. Uh, this is what he said. He said, it's easier to declare yourself a gay, drug-addicted kleptomaniac than a born-again Christian. Saying you are born again, a born-again Christian, at an elite Hollywood party is like wearing a swastika to a Benibarith fundraiser. There is visceral, palpable contempt. And that's absolutely true. You can go to a place where people are having a great time. And like he says, amongst the Hollywood elites, and you say, oh, yeah, I'm born again. Well, in John 17, 14, Jesus said it like this. I, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So, the world is in active opposition against us. And so we're to buy back the moments because the days are evil. Therefore, verse 17, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Therefore, do not be foolish, be unwise. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Always remember when you stand with Jesus Christ, you will be treated cruelly. In Matthew 10, 25, Jesus said, it's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? And so what we do is we don't act unwisely, but we understand, notice, what the will of the Lord is. So somebody says, well, that's my problem. I don't know what the will of the Lord is. Well, it was as we've been going through Ephesians, He's saying, well, this is the will of Lord, the Lord, that we, as followers of God, walk in sacrificial love, live a sexually pure life, have good reputations, know God's word to be protected from deception, live in the light, expose sin by a holy life, and being careful in the way that we live. And so this all now leads to an exhortation that we are to walk in the Spirit. Verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, 
but be filled with the Spirit. Here we go. I want to develop this with you. Okay, how are we going to how are we going to keep all these commands? I mean, we've been going from chapter 1 to chapter 5 and we've seen so much about who we are in Christ and and what Christ expects of us, how we're supposed to live and all and how am I going to do that? How am I going to be able to live this way? And he gives to me the, the, the added ingredient, the thing that is most important, which is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Christianity isn't a philosophy of life alone. It's not a strategy for successful living. To be a Christian requires the power of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Prior to Pentecost, we didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would, would descend on somebody, but also would, would, would leave them. That's why David would say, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's why Samson knew not that the Spirit had departed from him. Because the Holy Spirit would come upon, empower, but would also leave. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is coming upon us and is within us and is with us. And so it's a different kind of, of working of the Spirit. So for me to live for Christ requires not simply the desire to obey. That's naturally, that is important, very key. But it requires the power of the Spirit to be able to obey. That which I desire to do, Paul said, I am unable to do. Uh, I'm a wretched man. Who will save me from this body of death? Uh, well, it, what, what the answer is, is the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And so we're to be filled with the Spirit of God. Again, it's our Christian faith is not simply reading a book. And it's not just having a, a Christian philosophy. It, it's not a strategy to live well or to have success. It, it requires the power of the Spirit of God. And, and what he's doing here, and we're going to look at this to illustrate being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul contrasts this with drunkenness. In saying this, he's contrasting a spirit-led life with a carnal, flesh-centered life. Let me develop this with you. The ancient Greeks worshipped a variety of nature gods. One of their gods was called Bacchus. He was the god of fruitfulness and vegetation. He was also the god of wine and ecstasy. When his followers worshipped, they would drink and then get drunk. And after drinking, the priests would prophesy under the influence of their god. So while under the influence of alcohol, they gave what were called their words or their oracles. The worshippers of Bacchus would engage in excesses of every kind including sexual orgies. They believed that drunkenness was a proper way to worship the God who invented wine. Because they were changed after drinking, they were under the influence. They believed Bacchus was influencing them. So whatever they did while drunk was blamed on his influence in their lives. Hey, baby, I didn't mean to say that, man. I was drunk. I didn't mean to do that. I was drunk. That still goes on to this day. That really isn't me. You know I'm not that way. The only reason I did that or said that or whatever is I've been drinking. That's no different than all the way back 2,000 years ago when the worshipers of Bacchus said whatever they said or did under his influence was his fault. And that's what Paul is contrasting. And we're going to look at that a little bit further. As a matter of fact, a lot further. So that brings us to what Paul says when he says this kind of thing. And I want you to notice how he says it. He says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. That's another word we don't use every day. It means to be without self-control. When somebody is acting in, in that fashion, when they're um, under the influence, they are without self-control. And so that's what he's saying. You're lacking control when you're under the influence of this carnal and fleshly substance called wine. So that brings us to 
one of the questions many Christians have today. And it's one of the topics that provokes heated arguments amongst believers. And here's your question. Is it okay for me as a Christian to drink? Okay, we'll close now. No. Okay. So, it's instructive to note that Paul just wrote instructions on how to live. He had just said, walk carefully. He had said, redeem the time. He had said, do not be unwise. And he said, understand the will of God. Then he writes, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. So the practice of drinking, when argued for by those who believe it permissible, is usually presented under the liberties that believers enjoy within the sphere of the grace of God. The argument usually centers on the premise that it's intoxication that is forbidden, but drinking is not. So if someone enjoys wine or beer, it's permitted if one does not get drunk. Now, those who believe it wrong are usually labeled legalists who are imposing their strict moral values on others and who do not understand the grace that has given us liberties, which would include social drinking. There's your argument. Those who do not believe in recreational drinking will often look at those who drink as carnal because they appear to have the values of the world. They're uncaring about alcohol's dangers and oblivious to how others view them and the detriment to their witness such behavior is. Now, all of this is hinged on their understanding the times that they're living in. Paul was saying you are living in days when the entire culture is in hostile opposition to you. And because the days are evil, and because the enemy is prowling around to upset, destroy, or to do everything he can to undermine the gospel in your life, you need to be aware of that. The whole culture is against you, and the enemy is against you. And so in spite of all of this, Paul is saying we are to live Christ-honoring lives. Now, in chapter 4, verse 24, Paul had told them to put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And this is the kind of life that we have been designed for. You see, our lifestyles reveal the sincerity and maturity of our faith in Jesus Christ. It also reveals the depth of our love for him and our devotion to him. And this love for Jesus is evidenced by the consistency of our works and our words. This new way of life is not something we create for ourselves. It's supernaturally empowered. It's made possible by the Spirit of God. And so we're to live in a way that gives God the glory. So again, what about alcohol and the Christian? There are Christians who have no problem drinking. They argue in its favor. I call them alcohol evangelists. They attempt sometimes to even argue people into their position. Many who argue in favor of grace are very often more concerned with their desires. Perhaps they're unaware of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, when Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I like to refer to, and I do so in a, in a way that's not condemnatory. I just use the phrase. I heard it somewhere. I repeat it. Forgive me if it offends you. I call them sipping saints. That's an old phrase. So if you're a sipping saint, I want to I ask you a series of questions concerning alcohol. Let this permeate for a moment. If you're an alcohol evangelist, if you believe that your liberties are greater than the effect you have when you stumble somebody who has a weak conscience. Here are some questions. Is alcohol costly? Do they give it away free most of the time? Is it something that I should spend my money on? Is it habit for me? And if I become addicted, how will it affect my life? How will it affect the life of my family? How will it affect my friends? Can I make poor decisions while under its influence? Can my life and those I love 
be affected by it? Will it offend other Christians? Do I have to defend my drinking to others? Will it harm my Christian testimony? Can I share the gospel effectively while drinking? Is it right? Has it improved my testimony? And has it made me more like Jesus? You might find this interesting. These are fairly recent statistics. 76 million Americans who do not drink have an immediate family member who is an alcoholic. Alcohol addiction is the number one drug problem in the United States. In the last 50 years, more Americans have died due to alcohol than the deaths of World War I and World War II combined. 25 to 40 percent of all hospital beds in America have people in them with an alcohol problem. 50 percent of all traffic fatalities are related to alcohol. 20 percent of all freezing deaths are related to alcohol. 25 percent of all choking deaths are related to alcohol. 50 percent of all falling deaths are due to alcohol. 52 percent of those who die in a fire it's related to alcohol. 60% of all suicides are related to alcohol. 64% of all murders are related to alcohol. 69% of drownings are related to alcohol, as are 72% of robberies and assaults. 60% of all rapes are related to alcohol. 80% of all criminal court cases in the United States are related to alcohol in one way or another. Up to 50% of teen driving deaths are related to alcohol. 77% of all high school students in America claim to have used alcohol or are presently using it. 44% of all 8th graders have used or are presently using alcohol. In the United States, there are 500,000 children between 9 and 12 that are alcohol dependent. 11,000 underage young people try alcohol for the first time every day in the United States. Interestingly, in the United States, alcoholism is classified a disease. If it's a disease, then why are there breweries and distilleries? Why are there liquor stores and bars that have to be licensed to sell this disease? Why do you have to be a certain age to get it? And why do you pay taxes on it? One website said that Americans spend approximately $57 billion a year on alcohol. Now, if there were labs making and selling hepatitis or meningitis, COVID, <laughs> they would be closed down. Someone said, no one starts out to be an alcoholic. Everyone begins with a defensive attitude saying, I'm just a social drinker. There's nothing wrong with it. No one says, it is my ambition that someday I want to lose my job, my health, my self-respect, my marriage, and my family. Someday I want to be dependent on alcohol to get through my day. Yet this is the destination at which several millions of people have arrived. Now, why do you suppose that is? It's because alcohol is promoted and elevated as a normal or sophisticated activity in life. It is also expensive, addictive, and enslaving. Christians are not to yield to this kind of control over them. Just because it's legal does not make it morally right, and it doesn't make it spiritually right to drink. What about your children who are introduced to the use of alcohol by your example? The simple fact is the church needs God's power to be effective, and the pressure to conform to the world is constant, so we need his power constantly. The argument seems to be how much alcohol can we consume and still be solid believers? The answer is, how can I overcome the temptation to compromise my walk with Jesus? And that is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, the way, 
And I don't want to go into testimony time, and I'm, I'm going to do my best not to. I was during worship praying, and I don't need to give my testimony, so I won't. I'll say this. When I was a little boy, no, I'll say this. <laughs> There are a lot of people who say, I can drink. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not. I'm giving you statistics. I'm trying to bring you to understand something. I guarantee you, here in the United States, you will not be an effective witness of Jesus Christ if you drink. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Why? Because... Before I was saved, I was an alcoholic. And before I was saved, I would watch you. And if you were drinking with me, you didn't have anything I needed. I needed freedom from alcohol, but you're drinking. That's not going to help me at all. I want something that will set me free from the bondage I knew I was under. I needed that. I didn't need you being cool with me drinking a beer and talking about Jesus because I looked at you as a hypocrite. That's what I looked at you as. I thought, yeah, right. If, he, if he's so cool, why are you doing this? You know, I, I would figure that, you know, I heard somewhere that he satisfies you. How come you're not satisfied? Why do you need that for? That was my way of thinking. That's how I thought. And to a degree, I was right. Because if you were still dependent on alcohol, and that was the world I was living in, what do you have that I don't already have? What do you have? You have Jesus and and and. And wine, you have Jesus and your bourbon, you have Jesus. Oh, you're so cool because, or what, you drink the girly drinks or whatever. You know, I, I didn't get it. I didn't get I still, I still don't. I, I, I haven't, I, I was talking to John just yesterday. We did a little, was it yesterday? Yesterday, we did a little, um, I forget, what do we call it, John? John's, John's life, is that what we call it? <laughs> it's called Unfiltered. And John will ask me questions, and I just, I just share off the cuff with him. I just share what's on my heart. Now, we were talking about it just yesterday, and it seems to me that quite a number of people that I'm encountering and I have encountered over the years are, are caught up with alcohol. They want to be cool, sophisticated, free, whatever. But what I've discovered is, is see, when I got saved, and, and I, it, when I got saved, I, I, was, I was brought into a movement for Jesus Christ that that was filled with the Spirit. And so I, I after getting saved, I've never had a Holy Spirit hangover, right? I mean, I've I've never done something crazy or weird and had to explain it away. I'm sorry it was the Holy Spirit. I've I've never done that. You know, I, I, I was in I was out of my mind and I was brought into my right mind because of the power of the Holy Spirit. So when somebody wants to argue with me and say, I can drink, I say, you know. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. You, you may have the right to drink, and I'm not going to say don't. You're over 21. Make your own decision. But if you want to be used by the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to get away from the flesh and walk in the spirit. That's how it works. And part of the reason I see the church is in such a lousy condition is we've gotten away from the word, away from the spirit, and we've gotten into the world. And when you have that, you're not going to have success in reaching the lost. So you need to make up your mind that you're going to be used by Jesus Christ no matter what. Many years ago, when I, I was in my 20s, I was sitting in a, a, a pizza parlor in, in Huntington Beach. And as I was seated there at a pizza parlor, one of my friends says, you know, I hear that beer and pizza are good. I'd never even had beer and pizza, and I was already a Christian for a couple of years. So I said, I, I, I don't know, I'd never had that. And he says, well, let's, so he orders a pitcher of beer, and I'm sitting there looking at it saying, I can't do that. That isn't something I have the freedom to do. I, I was saved from that. I don't want to return to that. I was arguing in my, at the same time I'm looking at him. I'm, I'm a young Christian. He was raised in the church. I'm thinking, surely he knows more than me. Maybe I'm just a legalist. I don't know. So I've gone through that. Maybe I'm a legalist. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I have freedom in Christ. Maybe I can now drink without having to get hammered. I, I don't know. So I, he poured the beer for me, put it in front of me. And as I had this beer in front of me and they brought the pizza, I was sitting there. And I'm looking at my friend, and there's an old man who comes walking in off the street. He sits on the table right in front of me. He's, he's, he's six to eight feet away. He's right in front of me. And he's looking right at me. And I picked up the beer, and I took a drink, and I put it down. And God is my witness, believe it or not. 
this actually happens. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me in a way that was almost audible and actually in eternal voice. I heard it. Go share my love with that man. Go share my love with that man. And I was sitting there uncomfortable, and, and I said to the voice, I can't. The voice said, why not? I said, because I just drank some beer, and that man was looking at me, and now I can't. And as God is my witness, as God is my witness, two young men came into the pizza parlor. One sat on one side of the man. There were benches, sat on one side of the man. The other sat on the other. He is as close to me as my wife is. That's even closer. And I see this young man pull a Bible out of his pocket, open it up, and start sharing with this older man about the love of Jesus Christ. And the voice of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, if I cannot use you, I will find somebody else. I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. If I can't use you, I will find somebody else. I'm supposed to be ready at any moment to give an answer concerning the hope that lies within me. I can't put myself in a position with my perceived freedoms if it disqualifies me from a legitimate capability of sharing a gospel that sets sinners free. I, I, I can't put myself in that position. Even if I had a, a desire for alcohol, which thank you, Jesus, I don't. But even if I did, I still would take my liberties and put them under the authority of Christ so I might be used by God. Because to love somebody more than you love yourself is the essence of Christianity. And to care about somebody else's salvation more than I care about my perceived freedoms to drink some wine or some beer and be cool or whatever. You know, a long time ago, I made a decision in Christ I want to be used by you. And I don't want to do something that will keep me from being used. And believe it or not, there are still people who will look at you drinking beer and think of you as just being emotionally immature or worldly. And when you try and share with them about Jesus, they're not listening to you because your life isn't set apart. You're part of the world as far as they're concerned. I don't want to be that. So, what we need is the power of God to be effective. If we're going to reject fellowship with the works of darkness, we need God's power. That's why verse 18 says, be filled. That word filled is in a Greek tense that means keep being filled. Be totally under the control of the Holy Spirit. Be permeated by and filled completely by God's Holy Spirit. That is the fruit of being filled with the Spirit. And he begins to share that in verse 19. This is what it is. If I'm under the influence of the Spirit of God, if I'm filled with him, verse 19, this is what I do. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So being filled with the Holy Spirit is and has what is called an outward and an upward expression. And we openly worship with others and we express our praise upwardly to God. Why would Paul speak about believers singing together? It's because Christians are not like the world. You see, when the world gets together, they party. When Christians get together, we worship. We, we have the desire to edify one another. That's why Paul speaks of, of, of uh, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. We, we gather together as we did tonight, and we'll close in this way. We gather together to remember who we are and to remember who he is. And in, in the spirit of praise and worship, we give to him the honor that is, is due. The word worship is, is an old uh, English word, worthyship. It speaks of God's worthiness of our praise. In, in, in the Greek, proskuneo, it, it speaks about actually an intimacy it can be used in terms of drawing close and it could be a way to describe even kissing the face of God that's worship and so we are to worship with one another it's not simply by myself but it's corporate it's all of us and, and, and as I do so 
I, I demonstrate that, I, that I, I not only love God, but I love my brother and I love my sister. You see, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs reveals our hearts. You make melody in your heart and your mouth proclaims what is inside. And those who have learned to sing with the psalms are the ones who are easily filled with the spirit. It reveals the quality of relationship that we have with other Christians. And, and it's, it's one of mutual edification. He says in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. This is our upward expression. When we're walking in the spirit, we have a thankful attitude towards God. In Colossians 2, 6 and 7, Paul said it like this. He says, as you have, re as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, Walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Of all human beings on the face of planet Earth, Christians are to be the most thankful. Why? Because we're just passing through. Earth is not our home. Jesus has prepared a place for us. And he's going to take us up to be with him. And because we are heavenly minded, we're not attached to the things on planet Earth. God loves us. And God has blessed us. In Psalm 68, verse 19, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Psalm 103, verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. And so we are blessed and we sing praises and we worship and we have fellowship. We have what is called the body life. And then in verse 21, we actually do something. We submit to one another in the fear of God. Paul knew that a church could split if pride and self-seeking invaded it. To be effective, the church must live in love and humility. And the members of the body avoid selfish ambition. In Romans 12, 10, it says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. In Philippians 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? That really is. That really is. We're living in a world, and I'll say a couple of things and then close, but we're living in a world where getting what I think I deserve is more important than treating you in the way I should. People, people, people have lost a, a sense of, of common courtesy. They've, in many ways, many, not all, but many have, have lost the sense of common decency. Sometimes you'll see somebody walk by with a message on their T-shirt that's filthy. Sometimes they're just spewing out profanity as if it's just common language, and today it really is. Sometimes they don't care if it's a lady there or not. They'll speak in the way that they want to or act in the way that they want to. We're living in a very self-serving society. So of all people, we ought to be the most humble and we ought to be the most sacrificial. We ought to learn to be that way. And one of the ways we learn to be that way is amongst each other with one another. We, we do nothing out of selfish ambition. We don't push ahead. We don't try and get our own way. We, we want to honor the Lord and love each other. You see, when I first got saved, there was a huge move of the Holy Spirit. There were so many amazing things taking place and so many people were getting saved because we, we, we came out of darkness. We came out of the filth. We came out of that, that vomit of the world. We came out of that alcoholism and the drugs and, and the promiscuity. We came out of that. We didn't want to go back to it. And we knew people, we knew people who were still trapped. And so what we wanted to do is like we ran out of a burning building. We, we were able to compose ourselves and we ran back in. That's what we did. We ran back in the building. When other people were standing and looking, somebody's dying in that building, the Christian was running back in. We were grabbing our dad. We were grabbing our mom. We were grabbing our brother. We were grabbing our sister. We were grabbing our friends. We wanted them to know Jesus Christ. We wanted them to know Jesus more than we wanted to drink wine and more than we wanted to smoke dope and more than we wanted to sleep around. We wanted them to go to heaven, and that's what the church needs to awake to today. We need to come back to that. We really do. We really do. 
There's so many silly arguments that people want to get into with me and other pastors. Oh, are you? I mean, go on Facebook. Go on one of the social media. Somebody says something about loving Jesus. Before you know it, you got 15 different people correcting them about the scripture they just used. Man, they, they strain it at gnats and they swallow camels. They really do. They argue. It's one of the, it's, that's not the fruit of the spirit. But it's like it's a new one. The gift of argument. And somebody was arguing the other day. He said, listen, it, 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 you know, Cain killed his brother Abel. You can, and, and, and he said, you can use a rock to kill somebody. And before you know it, you got people arguing about what weapons you can use. <laughs> And it's like, how did we get over here? He's simply saying it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Why don't we begin to concern ourselves with the hearts of people? Why are we so quick to try and pass laws that will not bind people's behavior? Why are we so quick to do that? Saying, oh, the answer is we pass a law. Oh, really? We've got thousands upon thousands of laws, and they're broken every day. So it's not a matter of simply having a law in the book. It's a matter of a heart that's corrupt. That's why we preach the gospel. Because what is going to keep me from going into the flesh and doing something foolish if I love a person? Jesus said, this is how all men will know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And he spoke that to this odd group of men that had every reason to argue all the time. And they did. You see it in scriptures finally becomes who's the greatest but they argued all the time and jesus had to teach him on that final night by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another stop trying to push yourself ahead and be the greatest in the kingdom learn to be a servant learn to humble yourself let god exalt you let god put you in that position stop striving to be something famous just be careful to love one another that's important so paul is saying don't be intoxicated don't fall under the influence of this world. You have great potential, so cultivate it. Be continually filled with the presence of the one who is all wise, who is all knowing, and who will guide you in everything because that's what you have been constructed for and that's what the church is supposed to do. May we love God, love one another. May we be filled with the spirit and avoid anything that disqualifies us from preaching the gospel to a lost person. Amen? Amen. And Father, we ask that you would...